So welcome everybody to uh, Brookings. Uh, we are very excited to be able to welcome the chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton. And uh, we're also going to have, following um, my conversation with Mr. Clayton, we are going to uh, have a panel. And there won't be a break between the two. So the panel will follow directly on um, from, the, from the discussion we have. I have a um, uh, note that I re uh, need to read here. Uh, per Brookings policy, um, we like to acknowledge that SIFMA, NASDAQ, and Davis Polk all have provided support for the Economic Studies Program, uh, and we'd like to reiterate Brookings' commitment to independence, as well as underscore that the views expressed today are solely those of the speakers. Okay, now with uh, Good disclosure. That, that out of the way, uh, that's relevant for the panel, since uh, some, some of the folks on the panel have, uh, have those connections. Um, well, I was wondering as we were talking where exactly to start, but I thought maybe I'd start on the issue of what can be done to help uh, Mr. and Ms. 401k, as you've, as you've described it. Uh, as we all know, uh, people are now um, much more required to manage their own money, uh, to make decisions about how much to save. Uh, so company pensions are gradually being uh, phased out. Um, and uh, so what, uh, what do you think you can do in the SEC uh, to help Americans handle that, how to make those decisions and how to manage their money and where to put their money? You know, it's a, it's a really broad question. And and we'll narrow it down. Yeah, no, 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 but I, I, but I, no, no, I, I, um, I like that it's broad, and it, it may be cliche to say Mr. and Ms. 401k, but in my in my four months at the commission or five months at the commission, I, I increasingly believe that's the lens through which we should look at virtually everything we do. And and you you hit on some of the stats. I mean. In the last four decades, I was looking at, as I told you, I was looking at a Brookings report, so it must be right. It must be right. <laughs> um, in four decades, we've gone from 20% um, of retirement assets yeah. in 401ks to 60% of retirement assets in 401ks. And that trend's going in that direction, which means yes. Yes. responsibility has gone up three times, if you want to use that metric, and it's going to yeah. keep going, and it's, yeah. on, it's on the individual. So there you go. Then... I've been looking, and I'm, and I'm trying to get better data, and you guys can uh, probably get me your data, but uh, how much of our equity market is really retail money? And if you throw out the foreign investment, there's a fair amount of foreign investment in our equity markets. I don't know. Somebody, some, somebody in this audience probably knows it precisely, but it's you know, like 25 30% or something right, like that. Right. Then you boil down what's left of the domestic assets. Most of it, directly or indirectly, is retail money. Right. So... You know, we're channeled through but, mutual know, funds and stuff yeah. mostly. Actually, the, the direct retail money is a small, yeah. but you know, channeling it through mutual funds or other things, it's, it's a lot. And um, so at the commission, we should be looking at that audience when we're making decisions. And you know, that's, that's how I'm looking at my job. And what can we do for them? Yep. I think that and I've, and, I, and I've made this, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. The most inexpensive way for retail investors to participate in economic growth that we've devised to date is the public markets. The ability, the, the cost of investing, you know, the, the drag on your return right. is the lowest for a retail investor there. So that's the place to look to grow opportunities for retail investors to invest, in my view. Now, you quality opportunities. And I want to be clear about that. They have to be high quality opportunities. And, you know, there's a lot of high quality companies. There are some aspects of the market that the quality is not as good as it should be. So I gave you a long answer, sorry. No, uh, uh, but a good answer. And I want you to expand on it a little bit. So uh, let's, first of all, let's talk about the part that's not high quality. So there is some fraud going on, and uh, in your testimony, you talked about the dumping, uh, pump and dump in, in uh, Long Island, and there are certainly other examples of, of that. 
So can the SEC uh, deal with that kind of fraud? Is it dealing with that kind of fraud? How can we minimize uh, that? Because, you know, a lot of older people um, are often somewhat easy marks for that kind of fraud. Uh, they may be concerned that they don't have enough money, so someone comes along and says, oh, I can get you 10% 10, 10 or 15% rate of return, just put your money with me, uh, and then they end up with no money. So how, are you, how can you deal with that kind of fraud? Is uh, any of the new techniques of big data and so on, uh, better data collection, any of those things that you think the SEC or other agencies can, can help deal with that? So like people always say, hey, what are the things that have surprised you going into this job? The amount of garden variety retail fraud that is still going on surprises me yeah. and really bothers me. Um, and so I've asked our Division of Enforcement, our um, Office of Compliance and Inspections, Corporation Rights, to look at this from different angles. Enforcement's like, what can we do better to root out the fraud? And, and also um, uh, our, our investor education. What, you know, using data, yeah. compliance and inspections, I'm like, okay, what, how do these frauds work? And what could we change? Just tell the audience what is pump and dump pump for those who so don't. Pump, so, so pump and dump is um, usually a very small cap company, small company, penny stock company, um, various actors raise the price of the stock they, through buying activity. Hey, look at this stock. It's rising. Look at how the trades are going up. The stock must be doing well. Pump out research saying this is a great company. Could be fraudulent research, whatever. And then while the stock has risen, They've invested down here. They get you know, unwitting, usually retail investors, to buy up at the top their shares. They're getting out. And then it's game over. And this, you know, this is a garden variety type fraud that's still going on. Um, and they target affinity groups. They target the elderly. Um, you know, actually, you know, even even an affinity group of federal employees was was uh, was targeted wow. in a case like this, which wow. is which is kind of interesting. Um, so a couple, yeah, you know, we can do some. Let me put it this way: I want to do what we can to stop this nonsense. Yeah, because the American people need to know that we have their back on on that, as well as the companies you read about in the newspaper. Do you have access to the data you need to do that? We have some access to some data, but there are some things that um, I'm looking at changing like custody and transfer agent so that so that you know we if there is a problem we can better prove that it happened um, another another area where um, I think data helps is we have a we have databases and FINRA has databases for bad brokers and bad investment advisors you know um, people can look up who they're dealing with there's there's actually not a great data set out there for bad people who were not registered as brokers or investment advisors. We're trying to work on pulling together a data set for those types of folks. Yeah. Um, what about the fiduciary rule? So the previous administration felt that um, investment advisors were not always giving uh, the best advice that was in the best interests of the clients that they had. Uh, as, as you know, obviously, the industry said, no, that's not true. We are giving the best, uh, best advice, so I don't want to come down either way here. But, but uh, that debate sort of is still going on. Uh, there is a fiduciary rule that's now out there. Um, is, there a sense, uh, is there a way in which the SEC can uh, get involved with that and perhaps working with the Labor Department to have a, an appropriate fiduciary rule or best interest standard that covers... Uh, everyone rather than just uh, the, the IRA rollovers, which were, were part of the Department of Labor's rule. So you, I mean, I don't know, we didn't, we didn't rehearse this, so I, we, this, uh, this may fall totally flat, but, <laughs> but you... Uh, we, we don't have to do everything rehearsed, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you probably have retirement assets. I do. And you probably have non-retirement assets. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have real estate and, and financial assets that are actually primarily uh, in retirement, yeah. yes. And, and when, you, when you deal across your different types of accounts, yeah. you might want to deal with the same person and have the same 
types of investment choices that kind of make sense. And there's a worry that where we are today, that's not going to be the case. Um, and let me, let me say this. The, the motivations, some of the motivations for the, the Department of Labor's actions, they're real. We see cases where people were being charged absurd fees. Right. We see, we see cases where there were conflicts that weren't disclosed. Those things need to be dealt with. Um, but we shouldn't have a kind of, you know, two different standards, two different types of relationships for the same client. So I'm, I, want, I call it, I'm, I'm, I'm working on how I, uh, how I articulate the um, entire approach to this, and I want to thank um, Secretary Acosta for reaching out to us and saying, is this something we can yep. work on together? Yep. But, so I've, I've kind of, I, I call it the, um, uh, the, the four C's um, on, on this, which is, you know, investors should have choice. Yep. You should have, you, you, we, we don't want a, a rule that narrows investor choice. Um, we should have consistency um, across, you know, accounts. We should have clarity. You should know what duty is owed to you. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we should also have cooperation. So choice, consistency, clarity, and cooperation. That's, that's what the rule set should look like. Now, for uh, s small investors, and, and so you, you mentioned that there is now really a vast pool of retirement assets. But it's fairly skewed. Um, the, the, a, lot, a lot of that is among, uh, well, people at a certain stage of their life or uh, people who are upper income have saved money. But there's, a, there's a, quite a pool of people who are saving for retirement but really don't have much. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard for the industry the, to serve that group, isn't it? Because it, they don't, you know, maybe they have $50,000, $100,000. In some cases, $100,000 is a, is a big amount for, uh, say, some of the insurance companies that, that provide uh, uh, savings products. So how do you serve that group? And do you think robo-advisors can be helpful in that regard? Um, well, to, you, to the last part of your question, your specific question, I'm all for financial innovation that helps investors. So if, there's, if there are financial innovations that are going to help investors, that's great. And you know, robo-advising may be that way, although we can't say just because you're using a robo-advisor doesn't mean you don't have an obligation to the investor. Exactly. Okay, we can't go there because that will drive probably too much activity to a, an asymmetrically regulated situation. Okay, so we can't have that. But this is why your, your question is, the person that has $50,000 and is going to have to take care of the retirement and needs to keep adding to it, that's, in, in the way our investing system works today, that's probably not enough money to make efficient private investments with all of it. I mean, it's, you know, you can have... I, I, and believe me, I am all for small, funding small and medium-sized businesses, finding out a way for people to invest $5,000, $1,000, $10,000 in an efficient way. But it is costly to make private investments as compared to investing in the public equity market. Yeah. And that's a motivation for me to make sure we have enough public equity market choices so that the drag on that $50,000 is as low as possible for the investment opportunities. Right. Um, you have spoken a bit about the need for financial education. Now, that's a, a tough one because I think uh, all of us would say, you know, it'd be great if we could have a, a better financial education, maybe if people t studied it in school. Um, but it turns out to be quite hard to um, provide that financial education in a way that people then understand even basic concepts of, of compound interest or uh, uh, the really an, an understanding <laughs> markets. Do you see a way uh, to improve, or do you see the SEC, is that one of your, your uh, remits to try to improve financial education, or is that more responsibility of the schools? Or No, we have, we have a responsibility to do it. The, we have an Office of Investor Education. Um, yep. 
I, I love those folks. They, they, they get bulletins out. They're doing videos. Um, they're, they're reaching out to affinity groups, which are some of our most vulnerable, yeah. and trying to help them. Um, and, I'm, and I'll you know, get a bit out of my lane here. That's what we should do. I think that financial literacy is something that needs to start at a way younger age. I mean, if you're going to be, res like, like we just talked about, if you're going to be responsible, I, I visited an Air Force base recently and talked to the, talked to the, um, the airmen and women about saving and investment. And we all know that if you start at age 22, 23, 24, the delta when you're retiring is huge compared to starting at age 45. Um, that should not have been the first time they heard that from me. They should have heard it at a younger age because you, so you can get your mind around it. So, you know, when you do get your first job, you think about putting 50 bucks a month yeah. into your tax deferred, you know, in, if you're an airman, federally matched retirement account. And if you get in the habit of doing that, you're going to be much better off. One, one problem, though, even with people who start saving early is that um, something, something happens. They have an illness and they're out of work for a while. Uh, they get divorced. Um, if something happens in their family. They, they need money to put their kids through school. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they pull the money out of that 401k. Um, how, do, how do we handle that? Is that something we just have to sort of build in and save a little bit more in the beginning so that we can allow that? Or well, tax, we should try tax, to fence it off? Tax policy is easy, right? <laughs> no. Okay. No, no I'm uh, just kidding. Um, I'll drink to no, that. No, no. I think I think I think you you raise a really good point, which is um, tax advantaged investing is part of our system. Should it just be retirement? We do have it for education. Do we add health emergencies? Right. Particularly if. This is the, you know, primary safety net vehicle. Is this self-directed? These self-directed vehicles. Those are those are good questions. They're 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 not my questions, but it does does show to me how important it is that that pool of assets that we we that we at the SEC think about that pool of assets being one that's going to grow yep. and one that has the appropriate amount of protection. Let me turn to the sort of other side of the market, and that is uh, the role of uh, uh, companies and access to capital and their ability to grow. So let me start with a fairly broad question. Um, we have had a very slow recovery from the uh, Great Recession, uh, low level of uh, investment, low level of, of economic growth. Some of that obviously is due to the aging population and the slow growth of the labor force. But even there, uh, after allowing for that, uh, we still have some concern about the level of, of uh, productivity and the level of investment. So uh, can the SEC do anything, do you think, to try to increase the rate of capital formation in our economy? Or what would be the, the things you would look for uh, to help that side of the, of the growth picture? Um, on growth is really important. The difference between you guys do this all the time, but the difference between it's compound interest uh, but, and the difference between two percent growth and three and a half percent growth for America ten years from now is is huge. There's 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 nothing that we could do that would have a greater impact exactly. than making that difference. Especially, and this is not just it's not just an insular domestic issue. Because America's place in the world depends on continued growth. You know, what are we? Three hundred sixty million people. Two and a half, three percent. You know, if we can, if we can get to three and a half percent, or compare that to one point seven billion people and six percent. Those those lines cross at some point. You guys do this too. Yes. And that's and that's something that that's something that should be in all. That's on something on my mind, and I think it should be on all policymakers' minds. As far as what you know, specific things we can do, I think our model, the model that people came up with in 1933 and 34, 
is a great model. And we should, we should continue to be looking at how, that, how to modernize that model. Um, I, I am troubled that um, a lot of companies do not choose to, uh, to, to go public, but we do have very robust private capital markets. They fuel growth. Um, you know, I think, uh, but I'm very, in everything that we do, I'm mindful of the difference down the road between something like two and two and a half and three and three and a half. So you have expressed concern, as, as have others, about the decline in the number of public companies and the decline in the rate of, of IPOs. Uh, you know, some people feel that's not a problem, but others, I think, uh, and you've expressed concern about that. Do you think IPOs are being discouraged because of regulatory barriers or because of our institutional structure in some way? The requirements we put on companies uh, yeah. to go public. So I get asked this question a lot, and then the question is, yes. and then the que <laughs> and the question is, is it regulation? It is many, many factors. Yeah, many, many factors that have caused a, a, a shrinkage, and it's a significant shrinkage in the number of public companies. It's not IPOs themselves. It's how many public companies do we have that are exchange listed, which means they have audit committees made up of really, you know, let me, let me, let me pause here because, you know, people say, oh, it's, are you trying to get rid of regulation? No. Um, let me make a point that is, you know, very important. Sarbanes-Oxley, people can debate different things about Sarbanes-Oxley. The creation of the independent audit committee with Financial sophistication, you know, are, are, do you qualify as, a, uh, as, a, as a, you know, a financially sophisticated person to serve on this audit committee? And the dialogue between, the, the, the mandatory dialogue between that audit committee and the auditors is probably one of the greatest enhancements to investor protection that we've had in the last 25 years. And it was actually a fairly low cost addition. Now, when you, when you get in there and you see the kind of dialogue that audit committees have today with their auditors and, you know, the disclosure that comes out of that versus 20 years ago, you can't help but say this is a huge improvement. So things like that, you know, are fast. And I, you know, I would I'll be clear, I would never take away the independent audit committee from, you know, a public company setting. Now, th th now let's take a step back. The type of rules that we have for a public company, take the top 500 names, um, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the, in the S&P, um, anybody can make a case that they're pretty much appropriate. There's some things that you need to look at. You say, Do, are we getting anything? But as a package, they're pretty much appropriate. If you take a step back and say, hey, could the same rules that apply to those companies apply to a company that's a regional company in a monoline business right. that's you know growing from a kind of you know, enterprise value of five hundred million to a billion dollars. If we were designing the system from scratch, we no one would say yes. No one would say yes. And so here we are, and I think we can figure out how to make our system reflect the fact that these companies got very big, are very important to our society. Disclosure is is very valuable for investors, valuable just as a general matter, versus this, what I would call the mid-market companies and smaller, where, I, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard for me to believe that the same model makes sense. So do you, I, I infer from that that you think maybe the auditing uh, uh, requirements for smaller companies could be eased? Well, uh, auditing, I, the bedrock of our, the bedrock of our financial system is the audit. I mean, you know, that, I, I, that is absolutely clear. But uh, the gap accounting rules, I, I don't know. I spent six years on an audit committee. They're, 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 they're pretty tough to deal with. They are. They and are sometimes tough. you sort of wonder, why on earth uh, do we have to do that? Um, so uh, we can, I'm we, just we, pushing, we, could we improve or streamline those rules a little bit? I, I have a, you know, maybe I have, I have a lot of faith in the folks that set those rules. 
Um, I, and I think they are mindful of these issues. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. And, and look, you got to be able to compare. You got to, you, if you have a small, smaller company, larger company, but they're in the same industry, you ha they have to be reporting the same way. Yeah. Um, what about the idea of, of trying to do more to make uh, capital a bit more patient? And I don't know whether you think that's uh, an appropriate goal or not. So the argument, as, as I'm sure you've heard it, is that we have uh, quarterly reporting. So that tends to make the CEO focus or have to focus on, on uh, quarterly earnings. Um, and a lot of CEOs will tell you um, that they are reluctant to make certain kinds of investment in technology in their workforce uh, because the payoff will be, you know, five, ten years down the road, not in the next few quarters. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that there's a, there's a role, and, and that's one of the reasons people sometimes cite for being a private company, mm -hmm. that you can, mm -hmm. you can be longer term in yeah. your you can take focus. your You can take your pain today. So, do you think short termism is an actual problem for, uh, uh, for our companies? And, and if so, is there anything we could, could do about that? So, so I, think the, I think the issue you articulated is a real issue. Yeah. I've, you know, I think we've all seen it. Um, on the other hand, people will tell you that the accountability that comes from quarterly reporting and the, the pressure on management to do better that comes from quarterly reporting is a huge benefit to the market. And the, and the ability of shareholders who are unhappy with management performance to you know, push the buttons right. benefits us all. So finding the balance between those two is is not easy. You can't, you, can't, you can't try to address one without thinking about the other. Okay. And, you know, it, this is on my mind because you do want long term. Right. You do want, you know, planning for the long term. What, actually, we were talking about Keynes earlier. Keynes always had the long term. Long time we're all dead. But the long time we're all dead. And, and the long term is nothing but the sum of a bunch of short runs, yeah. but all those things. But even you know, so, I don't think he would have been in favor of, you know, quarterly decision-making. Yeah. Um, and and um, one of the things that's, that's uh, being proposed is having different classes of shares. I mean, we have different classes of, of equities already, uh, some of which have differences in their, their voting rights and so on. Um, so one proposal is that you should have uh, really more of a vote if you've held the share for five years than if you just bought the share yesterday. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's either feasible or could it be a good idea? Uh, is it something worth looking at? I, I do think, I, in, in governance, yeah. at, a, at a macro level, I don't think one size fits all is appropriate. Different types of companies, different investment objectives. Um, so should we, should we think about things like that? I think we should. Now, governance is not just a, an SEC issue. It's largely a state law issue. Right. And there are lots of, there are, I'm watching the literature in this, in this area. There are people coming up with different types of exchanges and things like that. And it's, it's interesting because the, the fundamental question is, are we, are we investing, are our companies, are there, is, is, is their strategy have the right length of time built into it? Um. Let me, uh, let me bring up one specific, uh, there were, of course, a whole lot of changes in the rules that came about because of Dodd-Frank and as a result of the, uh, the financial crisis. Let me ask you about one of those, which is the Volcker rule, which has been a, a sore point for a lot of financial companies who say it makes it difficult for them to make markets, to hold the inventories of, uh, of securities. And uh, some of them, there's been some work um, at Goldman Sachs suggesting that this is disadvantaging smaller companies uh, because there's not as much turnover in their, in their, uh, in their bond listings. Uh, so do you see the, the possibility of, uh, are you looking at possible reforms in Volcker? I know this is a multi-agency issue and mm -hmm. it took a long time to mm -hmm. put out there in the first place. Uh, is this something that's sort of uh, ripe for review and re-examination? So the, 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 the policy behind the Volcker rule 
that you shouldn't be speculating with depositors' money. Right. I think you've heard Secretary Mnuchin on this. You've heard the, the Fed on this. Good policy. Right. Everybody, no one, I don't think anyone says that's bad policy. Have right. you, I, have, have you, uh, I, I agree. I, I feel that way. Good policy. The question is implementation, and we've now implemented it. And something that has that significant an effect, potentially, we should look at whether we've implemented it correctly. I believe that. Yeah. Okay. So it may be something that is worth taking a second look. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Particularly if it's having if it's having impact where where the um, let me put this where there's really no systemic risk benefit. I mean, it's they this ha this has both elements of individual issuer risk and systemic risk. And if it's you know having no benefit on either one of those, yeah. then you have to say, well, okay, let's think about that. But as a as a policy matter, I think there's pretty much agreement that it's mm -hmm. pretty good policy. Yeah. Um, so, so let me turn that over and say, you know, obviously we're taking a look and the administration is taking a look at things, capital requirements, Volcker rule, various things. Uh, you know, are, were these necessary in, uh, and, and should they be done in, in quite that way? But let me turn it back the other way. There are folks who say that we haven't done enough to improve safety that uh, banks and other institutions are uh, not as safe as they, uh, as they look. So from your position at the SEC, do you think enough has been done, uh, either with Dodd-Frank or, or subsequently, to ensure the safety of the system or the safety of financial markets that you uh, supervise? Or do you think there are places that more needs to be done? So I'm, I'm not going to get into the Fed's area, they're very competent people, or the OCC, you know, that's, right. That, right. that's their area. That's and, their I, area. And, they're, and they're, you know, we all know they're very responsible people who are, who are thinking about these issues on a daily basis. But as far as systemic risk goes, which I think is what your- Systemic your, risk is what I was talking about. Um, can, I, can I transition to systemic risks that weren't addressed in Dodd-Frank? Dodd Absolutely. And, you know, I've been talking about this for a while. Um, what are they? You know, that was, that was the last thing that we faced. I think we've done a pretty good job of dealing with it. It's front of mind for the banking regulators. It's yeah. front of mind for me. Um, but what, what else should be front of mind in terms of systemic risk? And I, I think cyber risk is a, is a risk that we should be looking at with the same type of urgency and focus that we look at whether we have sufficient capital. Um, so let's turn to cyber risk, which I, is, is uh, something I wanted to ask you about. Um, so it seems like every other day we get an announcement of a new uh, break-in, a new hack. Uh, a lot of our financial information is being, um, uh, being has been revealed. And, and by the way, since I'm going to turn it over to the audience in a minute, um, the chairman's not going to be able to talk about the Equifax situation, so please leave aside questions on that, and, and I'm not <laughs> asking about that. Um, but cyber risk, are we doing enough? Um, one of your former colleagues, uh, Rajan Cohen, has suggested we need a separate new government agency uh, to deal with cyber risk. It, it seems like it's a very scary thing that maybe we don't really have a handle on, uh, and certainly is, is impacting your agency. So tell us a bit about what you think we can be doing and should be doing um, on, to deal with some of those cyber risks. So, you know, when, when Raj talks, people listen, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, they do. Um, no, uh, it... You know, I've heard other people say, oh, no, 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 we don't want a, a, a separate agency. We want to do better within the existing agency. So you can argue that well, I, two ways. Whether, whether we have a separate agency um, or whether we have it in different agencies, having a coordinated exactly. approach to looking forward, but also being able to coordinate quickly if there's an event is something very important. And you know, I'm not the only one saying this. I mean, there are very responsible people at the other agencies who are saying this and acting on it. Um, but, I, but I do think people should understand that 
the risks are significant. Um, you know, if we have um, denial of service in major markets or other critical parts of our economic infrastructure, that undermines confidence. And confidence being undermined will have, will likely have, as history has shown, a significant effect on asset prices and the economy more generally. When, you know, when asset prices drop, it's much more difficult to grow the economy out of that. We've, we've, we've seen what happens. So, I mean, it sort of adds to a sense of, uh, you know, some of us, particularly in my age group, all the technical stuff is, is hard to understand, but it, it just seems like we, you know, it, 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 as you say, it undermines uh, confidence. Uh, do you think we can make these systems uh, secure? Um, do, do, I th do I think you can make... Um, you know, your, your system at the SEC, your trading systems? Uh, well, I think that, that's a loaded question, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a problem. Give me a loaded we, answer. Yes. Yeah, we had a problem, and, and um, the, the, rightfully, the, uh, the Senate Banking Committee asked me about it. And yep. People asked me, can you, you know, tell me? And I said, I can't tell you 100%. No, and I don't think, uh, I don't think anybody is going anybody to can. Tell, yeah. tell you 100%. That's the reality. And now we have to figure out how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let me uh, turn the, the questions over. So ground rules are, wait for a microphone, please. Please ask a question. Don't make a long speech. And uh, keep it very short. <laughs> All right. We've got a first person had their hand up here. And identify yourself, please. Hi, uh, Neil Haggerty with MLEX Market Insight. Obviously, when you first joined the agency, one of your priorities, uh, big priorities, was capital raising. Um, with recent events, um, and you spoke about it a lot in your Senate banking hearing um, about uh, cybersecurity risks, has capital raising had to take a half, have you, has that had to take a back seat, um, seeing these sort of risks that we're facing with the SEC hack and obviously with other issues? Neil? Yes. Yeah, no, thanks, Neil. No. Um, Capital formation is is not taking a, a back seat. I think there was a first a question there, and then we'll come down to the front. Yes. Uh. Hi, Susan Olson with Natixis Global Asset Management. Um, in the same vein as cybersecurity, how is the SEC approaching fintech um, through new ways of lending, new ways of capital formation, robo investing, blockchain? How are you approaching regulation um, in a way that is going to promote innovation and not stymie it? So, so we have a working group that is monitoring those issues. And you rattled off a number of things. Some of them are, are more in the banking sector than they are in you know, the, the security sector, our, our purview. But distributed ledger technology, we're seeing that. Unfortunately, we're seeing it in the enforcement division. You know, we're seeing... a a lot of it in the enforcement division and trying to deal with it around initial coin offerings, which, you know, it would shock me if you don't see pump and dump schemes in initial coin offering space. Um, in terms of the positive sides of fintech, uh, we're, we're, we're looking to embrace them, provided that there's the right amount of investor protection. Um, I do think that there's... Um, I'm optimistic that there's a fair amount of value in distributed ledger technology from a, say, accounting, record keeping, market tracing perspective. Probably will add efficiencies over time, will help us better monitor the markets. I'm hopeful that we're going to evolve in that direction. Yes, question here. Uh, Robert Shredder with International Investor. We've been developing a story about foreign ownership of corporations here in the United States, and we're starting to see a pattern where uh, particularly Chinese cross-holding companies, uh, state-owned enterprises, have been taking significant share positions, not always, not always making it clear that they are uh, developing uh, minority and, in some cases, majority ownership. We've asked your offices about this, and they really gave us a blank in terms of uh, whether anybody, even in the SEC, is following this mm -hmm. trend. 
So can well, you tell us what, what, what you're saying on is, foreign ownership no, of U.S. corporations I, I publicly held? I, I just wanted to I just wanted to articulate in terms of the in, in terms of the rule set that I think you're referring to, which is are are people filing their 13G and 13D reports on a group basis, like we would expect them to do so? When you have two or more related persons who are aggregating a position for a common goal, are they? letting the rest of the market know that that's what they're up to? Yes. I, I, will, I, will, I will tell you this, and you know, the, we don't comment on whether we have investigations or non-investigations. That's an issue that bothers me, whether, and whether, no, regardless of the source, because the, you know, we, we, have a, we, we have what I think is a very good approach to this, which is, you know, you don't have to disclose what you're doing. You don't, other people don't get to free ride on your investment thesis until you reach a certain threshold. But you know, that applies to everybody working together. And so I, you know, if this is going on, I welcome your story. Okay. So what, what bothers you about it? Um, I can understand if a Chinese company is trying to take technology and... and, and uh, <laughs> violate uh, uh, intellectual property standards, but if a Chinese company is, is holding, has holdings in a U.S. company, is that, is that a problem in and of itself? No, it's not a, it's not a problem. We, we have you know, free and open markets, but yeah. we, we do have rules on when you've um, acquired a significant enough position where, you're, where you are either going to try or will have influence over the company that you have to tell people you have that position. And so if you have and you know we can pick the threshold five percent or ten percent. If you have one person who's acting alone, who's at seven, yeah. you know, or at four, let's just let's go with the easy one at four. They don't they don't have to tell you when they go over the threshold. They have to tell you. But if you have four people at four, and they're all sort of and they're all working, working together, together yes. they're supposed to tell us. Okay. Do you do you think there's a different level of concern if this is coming from? Um, Companies in China that are basically state-owned companies. Yeah, that, let's not go with it. Let's not go with a. Let's, go let, let's not. Let's not be okay. Jingoistic about about the, about. <laughs> I, this I'm today. not trying but, to be. Yeah, no, I know. I, I like it though. <laughs> I just like using that word. <laughs> it's a good word. It's a good word. Okay, another question behind you there. Uh, I'm John Baker from Stradley, Run and Stevens and Young. Uh, there have been some suggestions that the SEC should look to uh, third-party compliance audits of investment advisors or possibly set up a self-regulatory organization for investment advisors. Uh, are, are these ideas that you are thinking about? You know, it's, let, me, let, let, me, let me respond to this. The question is, are we going to, for IAs, right, for for investment advisors, would we require a third party? Would we require a third party to come in and, and audit, make a report to us? It's not a, it's not, it's not a bad idea, but it's not, it's not front of my mind right now. I, our, um, I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased that our office of uh, compliance and inspections uh, has gone from uh, kind of a 10 percent per year coverage rate to I, I don't know where it's going to come out this fiscal year, but I think it's going to be at least 14. Maybe we'll get to 15, and they've done so um, using data uh, and doing so, so a fair amount of risk-based um, examination. And I'm uh, I'm watching it, but I'm I'm comfortable with I'm comfortable that we're making progress in that space in terms of our coverage. Question over there, and then there's someone at the back who's been very patient, so we'll we'll do this one and then. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jared Seberg with Cowan Group. Uh, I wanted to follow up on something that you testified about the other day. Uh, Senator Warren was asking you or suggesting that Mr. and Mrs. 401k is better off with fewer IPOs but larger companies going public. And you seem to suggest that, that the opposite was true. And I was hoping you could elaborate on, you know, what you see as the benefit of more companies going public sooner and uh, you know, if you could maybe counter what what she was discussing. Yeah, it was a. That, oh, that's a leading question. It's okay. a, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> There's like all sorts of. How long did that one take you to come up with? Yeah, but no, it's look. I'm, I I like this debate. I mean, the the question is, you know, what type of public equity market 
is best for Mr. and Ms. 401k. And, I'm, and I, I think that's, that's an issue we should be debating. And I'm, you know, Senator Warren uh, is a very smart person, and she has, you know, she, she has a view that bigger companies, they, safer, better investment. I, I like the number of large companies that we have to be able to invest in. I, I do believe that expanding the universe of opportunities available to Mr. and Ms. 401k on a portfolio basis, you know, expanding the portfolio of stocks from 4,000 to five or 6,000 would have benefits. So it's, I mean, we sort of have, there is at some level an optimal level of companies, right? And if that's being restricted because we've got two onerous rules on IPOs or for some other reason, then I think there's a concern, yeah, and, and we I'm, need and to little, get more. I'm a little concerned. If, I'm, I'm if more, it's a natural yeah. product to the market, then you sort of say, okay, well, that's what it is. And, and you have to have the protection. You have to have the audit. And, I, and I'm, I'm very clear on this. One, one benefit to companies going public is I've never gone through an IPO process where the company that emerged from the process wasn't a better company than the company, the private company going into the process. I, mean, I do think going through the IPO process and having to comply with the disclosure obligations, the public company audited and financial statements, to think about your company and your ability to describe it to investors makes the company a better company. Well, just to be a little provocative here, this was uh, from Andrew Ross Sorkin. It seems like a way of living in hell without dying. That was the way James Freeman the founder of Blue Bottle Coffee described the process of taking a company public in the modern era. Uh, so I, you know what? That's he not, ended that, up selling to uh, Nestle. Yeah. No, that's not the that's not the first time I've heard it. And if uh, you know, look, there's lots lots of panelists here. Will give you will give you their views and their numbers. And I'd encourage you to I'd encourage you to ask them. But if you if you said to me, mid market company. Um, 1995. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna adjust yeah. the dollars. I'm, I'm gonna talk about today's dollars. Yes. 1995. How much would it cost to go public, and what would it cost a year to be a public company? I'd tell you it would probably be about a million and a half, two million bucks to go public, and somewhere south of a million bucks a year to be a public company. Mm -hmm. Those numbers in, you know, constant dollars today, are multiples. Yeah. They're multiples. So, you know. That's that's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. I don't know you guys. You guys are going to come up here. You can you can throw your numbers out there. I'm sure Ken. I'm sure you have good data on this. <laughs> um, and we're going to get to the panel very soon. I think maybe a couple of questions. Maybe in fact, can you uh, collect about three questions? Uh, please make them uh, short, and uh, I'll then I'll quick. I'll ask. Uh, uh, Anna Ratner from CFP Board. Um, for the past decade, uh, a lot of SEC uh, chair people um, have expressed some sort of interest for the fiduciary rule, and even with Section 913, that has not come about. But you are very hopeful for some sort of fiduciary standard for both retirement and non-retirement accounts. Um, what has changed? What makes you think that uh, that is going to come out soon? Well, the, the, the fact that the Department of Labor has has entered the space. Um, I don't think we have a choice but to try. Okay, there's a question there. Gentleman in the glasses who's been very patient. Uh, thank you. Uh, Justin Lee, Assistant Professor of Finance at George Mason University. So uh, on the public market, like recently there is, I mean, the, not, the trend now is like the U.S., public market has made more and more dominated by passive index investors. And there's a lot of discussion in academia talking about the implications for the governance of the underlying portfolio firms. So I'm just curious about what the, uh, the SEC thinks about these things and what is the current discussion about these aspects. Another separate question is like, you, since you mentioned ICO and you're talking about like a lot of them is currently being in the uh, enforcement department, which probably is not surprising given that it's such a new market. But are there also any other discussions or studies looking into any potential economic benefits of having these type of new financing practice? Thanks. That's two questions. And I, can't, I don't know if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go quick. Um, you know what, from the academic community, 
please keep thinking about what the increased um, trend in index investing, particularly if we have a shrinking number of public companies and a larger, number, larger amount of dollars going into ind indexes. Please keep thinking about what that means, not just for governance, but what it means for market structure and trading. Because, look, it's, we're in a different era than we were 20 years ago in terms of the amount of index investing, the amount of passive money, and what does that mean for our markets generally? I'm very interested in that, and I hope, I hope that you and academia are interested in that as well and give us your views. Um, as far as uh, you know, ICOs, et, et cetera, you know, we, we, are, we are looking at it. Um, anytime there's an innovation like this, you should be looking at it. Um, I think I've, uh, I think I've made my, my, my views pretty clear that this is an area where um, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to retail investors. Well, it, we've uh, been, you've been extremely generous with your time and given us some really interesting answers. So thank you so much. I want the audience to, to thank uh, Chairman Clayton and uh, really appreciate your time.